I wanted to read some uh, things from my book that I am writing called uh, The Adventures of Tuba Man. During the 1984 World Series, Detroit Tigers played the San Diego Padres for the title. I was in the marching band at Wayne State University, and Harold Arnold, the rest of the piece, gave the band the incredible opportunity to play the national anthem at one of the games, and we got to watch the game as well. They even gave the band members a commemorative ticket valued at $250. It was an amazing gift to be given, to be honest. Well, I, I wasn't feeling very well that day. I was pretty sick, actually. I just wanted to go home after the game, but I didn't have any money. I'm good around some musician. My car was at Wayne State University. Wayne State, Detroit. There's a Wayne State in, in Nebraska, too, right? So we're talking Detroit. So Detroit. Okay. My car was at Wayne State, and I was, I was wearing our corny band uniforms, which spelled, please kill me if I dare to walk the three miles to the garage. So, I looked at my commemorative ticket, which was a legitimate ticket, valued at $250, and I decided to scalp it for money. I asked my tuba colleague, Roger Stubblefield, to take care of my sousaphone, and I asked for permission to leave, and Mr. Arnoldi, very incredulous, he said, okay. The conversation between Mr. me and Mr. Arnoldi went like this. Hey, Mr. Arnoldi? Um, oh, this is from Mr. Arnoldi. He goes, Haven? Whenever he's mad, he goes, Haven? Why would you leave a World Series game? Have you been to a World Series game before? See, when he was really pissed at me, he would talk very slowly. <laughs> and I said, no, sir, I haven't been to a World Series game before. You know I'm not much of a sports guy. I'm sure they'll be back next year, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Arnoldi said, just leave. sidewalk of Tiger Stadium and people were scalping tickets for $500, $700, got a ticket, one ticket, $700, and even twelve. I heard $1,200 for a ticket. Well, I decided that what I needed was money for a taxi and a tip. So I stood at the street corner and I said, World Series ticket, $20, <laughs> behind home plate. You can see everything. You just got to sit with the band. <laughs> Someone instantly showed up. And I mean instantly. They said, did you say $220? And I said, no, sir, $20. I just need to get to my car. He said, you know, you can sell this ticket for $1,000 and get it. And I said, yeah, yeah, I don't want $1,000. I need $20. I need it for the taxi plus tip so I can get home. Are you absolutely sure? Yeah. Are you sure you want to sit with the band? You're pretty stubborn. <laughs> when I uh, taught at the University of Arkansas, I also worked two other jobs that I liked almost equally to my teaching duties. Uh, job, extra job number one, I worked for Northwest Airlines, which gave me all sorts of free flight travel benefits that I took advantage of constantly. And job, extra job number two, I was principal to with the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra, which is based in Little Rock, which is around four hours from Fayetteville. Yeah, the ASO is a great group. Um, they did lots of shows, and I would regularly use my travel benefits from working at Northwest Airlines to fly to Little Rock for free and rent a car in Little Rock. Um, the flight only took 38 minutes, and I felt like a damn rock star. You know, jet center, flying to my gigs, you know? Um, but none of the women. Anyway, the, the night before my epic Middle Eastern recital, the ASO had a show. Since the show was over around 10 p.m. or so, I decided to spend the night in a hotel they provided for symphony members from out of town. So the next day, uh, which is the day I was supposed to be doing a, an epic Middle Eastern recital, and including dancers and, and uh, singing in Arabic and all that, I drove to the little, uh, airport in Little Rock, I dropped off my rental car, and I went to the gate, and I was at the gate uh, for my flight, which was about five hours before my show. Piece of cake, right? Flight's only 38 minutes. Well, on this day, there was a bit of a delay. There was fog at the Fayetteville Airport, and it was closed. Now, in the 150 times or so that I had flown from Little Rock to Fayetteville, I had been delayed only three times, and then for only about two hours. 
There's a lot of fog in the valley where the old Fayetteville Airport was, but still, by the time I got to 11 a.m. or so, the fog would lift and the airport would be open. No worries, right? So, after an hour, we get the notification. After an hour, we get a notification that Fayetteville Airport was open. It was time to go. Yay, I said. We still have about four hours before the recital. There's nothing that could go wrong, right? We get to our plane, which is this amazing $4.5 million Beechcraft 1900 series, 1970 turbo prop, vagina plane, I call it. And because it, 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 it's, it reminds me of a vagina because it can take a pound of you know, turbulence, bad weather, small airfields, lots of luggage, um, and keep coming along. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I think it's interesting. Um, I love the Beechcraft series planes. Uh, we get into the air around 11 a.m. The flight is supposed to be around 45 minutes. It's a very bumpy ride. Uh, the plane is full. We look like 19 bobblehead dolls as we're bouncing all over the plane. At 12 p.m., the pilot tells us there's freezing fog, trouble in vagina, in, in, in the vehicle, and we must circle the airport. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just said it. No problem. I only have to go to the bathroom a little bit. The other passengers seem to feel the same and wait spirit as me. We circle the airport for 30 minutes. There's a very pretty young woman next to me wearing a gray cashmere sweater. I did try to say hello to her, but she made it plain that she was not interested in talking. No problem. She was also wearing blue jeans and chocolate boots. Her hair was very blonde and very long, and she's wearing these nouveau rich, tiny John Lennon-esque glasses. She is the quintessential preppy in training. She screams, you are not to talk to me. She doesn't say the word the, the, word, the entire flight. Uh, However, a few minutes into circling the airport, she suddenly gets very agitated and starts looking in her seat pocket like she had dropped her gold Willy Wonka ticket in there. She turns to me and says, I hate flying. I almost always get air sick. And there's no vomit bag in my seat pocket. Do you have a vomit bag in your seat pocket? I look at her and I blink twice. As suddenly everything has gone sideways in my brain. I say to her quickly, I'm sure there's something somewhere in here, and I start to look in my seat back pocket. But in my head, I am screaming, oh my god, there is no thumb back. And then there's a lurch as the plane starts one of those several deep drops that we would encounter that day. The pilot gets on the mic and says, cheerily, we're going to try to land, but we have to get low enough to see the field, because there's nothing but clouds. We hit turbulence hard, up 35 feet. Down 35 feet, to the right 40 feet, to the left 50 feet. But only one person screams out, me. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them are keeping it together. The gear is down, the flaps and slats are fully extended, the engines are whining, there is nothing but clouds. Then you hear the whoop, 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 decision height alarm screaming in the cockpit. Uh, everyone in the plane can hear it. Still, all you see is fog. The pilot pulls out harshly, and as we hear the word terrain, 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 pull up, pull up, pull up, the wheels go in, the flaps uh, go back, and my new best friend to my right is now incandescent white. She glows with sickness, and this is not good. The pilot cheerily tells us that we are going to find, try to, to uh, land at the airfield once again. Now, usually, I love flying in bad weather. Uh, I'm a former United States Marine Corps AV. Uh, but I don't like this moment. Because by now, you're getting slammed with turbulence. And there's this woman next to me who doesn't want to talk to me, now wants to talk to me. And the plane is dropping 25 to 50 feet at a time. Free fall, slam up, free fall, sideways, free fall, tail slide. It's amazingly intense. After 45 minutes of trying to land, the woman to my right is now an alien green white. <laughs> she is now holding my hand. She just grabs it with a kung fu grip. I don't know her. I no longer want to know her. <laughs> she has my hand. I have been detained many times during my, um, my lifetime. Now, it hasn't happened in Omaha. I've lived here three years and I've had zero problems. I think the Omaha Police Force is pretty grand, to be honest. It's got some things that it needs to work on, as all do. But uh, the, the, for the most part, uh, the places I'm talking about have happened in Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, 
Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and this is one of the stories in the um, Adventures of Tuba Man. I am one of the sweet, oh, it's, it's called uh, Tuba Man and the Police. I am one of the sweetest, most lovable loves you would ever want to meet. Hugging me is like hugging a futon covered in unicorn kisses. <laughs> I love my country. I have served my country faithfully in not one but two branches of service. I feel I'm a pretty good American. Yet, being who I am, being the size I am, and possibly even the color, God shield us, that I am, I have had several brushes with the law. Let's compare my brushes with the law with your brushes with the law, shall we? Here are my brushes. My first detention was after a performance in Allen Park, Michigan, after a standing ovation given for me playing concerto with the Allen Park Symphony Orchestra. I was told I was leaving in a pack of cars when I hadn't a drop of alcohol in my system. Uh, an awfully humorous scene, I am sure, seeing me sitting in a police car with tie and tails. I got cuffed and released in about 45 minutes after being very polite and jovial. My second detention was in Madison, Wisconsin when I was attending graduate school. I was stopped on a bus trying to get into Eagle Heights apartment complex. I was taken off the bus and I was made to sit on the curb for, in 25 degree weather, zip tied with my hands behind my back. And I even got to lay on the wet, filthy bus deck before they put me, took me off of the bus. Turns out the police were looking for a rapist. They thought that that might be me. My third detention came in Chicago, Illinois, when uh, a police, I asked a police officer for help with my car as I had locked myself out. He was just sitting in his car, and I seemed to have surprised him, even though I called out several times as I was approaching his car. Please help me. Um, my hands were up. Down I went, and there I was, tied with a pair of handcuffs. One percent is too much. It's unacceptable, and so we have to fight that good fight to make sure. Love them without a doubt. I do. I have I find police officers who are willing to run into the fire my heroes because I'm not running into the fire. They're running into, into guns and they're apprehending people. I believe in I believe in the system. But I also believe that the system must constantly be monitored and tweaked and worked on. And we can't just willy-nilly say everything they do is right. That blue wall of silence is a sickness. We can't have it. We can do better. We can always do better. I was part of a group that would help with getting people who were um, sick or in wheelchairs off the plane. Um, there was a plane that was coming in, and uh, the story is to the man and the dying one. And this is a great lesson that I learned. Back when I was a teacher in Arkansas, so I already told you that story. I love the job as much as teaching. Uh, the life-changing lesson I learned at XNA was when a plane arrived with a woman who had cancer who needed help getting off the plane. Her cancer had progressed to the point where she was unable to walk. Um, Lori was her name. Uh, was returning home to be with her dad during her final days on Earth. Because the planes were so small, we had to use a special wheelchair that quite literally fastened the person to the chair, and then leaned them back like they were a large appliance, and we transferred the person from the plane onto a lift and then to the tarmac. Uh, the XNA airport did not have jet bridges or um, uh, on our side of the terminal. So everything was air stairs or long walks in the tarmac. The wheelchair dolly was incredibly uncomfortable for the passenger, but there was, there was no way to place an actual wheelchair on the plane. While the wheelchair dolly and the lift device were broken, I was asked by my boss if I could pick the woman up and carry her from the plane down the stairs to the wheelchair that was waiting for her. I said, yes. Little did I know that my life was about to change forever. I went to the stairs after all the parents, uh, passengers had left the plane and saw her sitting there. She was so small. She was maybe 80 pounds total. She was 35 years old. She looked so much older than that. She was so frail. She was yellow, and you could tell from her eyes that her journey here on this earth was almost complete. I did not get over the size of her eyes. They looked like a baby's when they were born. They were giant, totally disproportionate from the size of her body. I'll never forget her eyes. I said, ma'am, 
I'm here to help you down the stairs as our wheelchair is broken. May I have the honor to lift you up? She started crying and apologizing for being a burden. I'm so sorry to trouble you, she said. I cannot walk. I used to run marathons and I now cannot walk. I told her it was my privilege to help her down the stairs. She had unfortunately wet herself during the trip and was quite embarrassed for me to have put, to put my hands in, in that mess. Since I had changed many diapers before, it meant nothing to me to stick my hands up under her and lift her up. It was my honor. It was a blessing beyond blessings. Still, I prayed. And I said, God, please do not let me screw the pooch on this one and fall down the stairs as I was carrying her. Please, God, do not let me hurt this woman in any possible way. That's what I kept praying. And very thankfully, I did. She kept crying and apologizing, and I kept telling her that it was my honor and that she was blessing me as I walked her down the aisle of what suddenly felt like the longest, narrowest, most gargantuan plane in the world. Finally, I got her down the stairs, and her dad was waiting for her. He was in tears and mildly shaking. He was an older, frail man, but he looked about 10 years younger than his daughter. He asked me if I could help her into the car. As I placed her gently into the wheelchair and at the bottom of the stairs, I said, of course I could. As we were walking her to the car, she kept reaching into her purse. She told me she wanted to give me something. I told her just being in her presence was enough. I didn't need anything else. What she didn't understand, that this moment was a holy moment for me. This moment was sacred. This moment was changing my life forever. I was in the presence of someone who clearly saw death sitting next to her. There was no escape, there was no ambiguity, there was no negotiation, there was no 11th hour miracle, just acceptance. This was a very sacred time for me, as well as for her. We get her to her dad's car, which is a huge Mercedes-Benz S-Class thing, and I placed her in the front seat and buckled her in. She kept crying and apologizing for being a burden. Then she gave me what was the biggest roll of money I had ever seen, I couldn't possibly accept such a gift. I gave it back to her. She said, please take it. I told her I could not. Finally, I looked to her dad who looked at me and said, please accept your money, son. She doesn't need it anymore. I ended up giving it to my church. She taught me that day that time on this earth is your real currency. What would she have done and what would we pay for five more minutes of good help? What would she have given to be able to run again? Billionaire or pauper, your most precious commodity is time. You cannot save one second of it. You spend everything. That 15-minute encounter at a small airport in a small town at a small state changed me forever. That 15-minute encounter taught me that we are living this life all wrong. That, that moment taught me that we are all totally equal. Everything else is bullshit. She changed my life forever, and for her, and for that moment, I will always be grateful. What does life really mean to you? Making money, status, great job, being better than others, success. I think ultimately life boils down to either love or fear. I choose love.